Welcome to the After Collapse Core Concept Series. I'm Max Borders, and let's get into it today, talking about hierarchy. Hierarchy. Specifically, I want to talk about not only what hierarchies are, but how they break down. Now, first, what's a hierarchy? You know, this is an organizational form I think we're all familiar with. And to varying degrees, we like it or dislike it, depending on how much we've had to work in one. But we certainly understand the form intuitively. So it's an organizational form that's structured according to rank in some sense. So there are superordinate nodes or people who give orders and subordinate nodes who are people who take commands and carry out tasks. There are a few at the top who make decisions about what tasks are to be carried out and the many at the bottom carry out the tasks. So to fill in the gaps, a lot of times you'll see these procedural checklists and things like that, but more or less, this is how a hierarchy is governed. Now, we want to make sure we talk about the different types of hierarchy because they're not always so clear cut. For example, there's emergent hierarchies, which are hierarchies that form based on uh, considerations beside uh, on considerations beyond the scope of this conversation. We want to focus on formal hierarchies where it is determined in advance who is to give the commands and who is to take them. OK, that is a formalized tr structure. There are also dominance hierarchies and competence hierarchies. To give you an idea about what kinds of uh, hierarchies might be emergent, you can think of going to someone who's a leader for their advice and listening to them because they're so competent and so experienced. They tend to make decisions on behalf and you might want to carry out their decision based on their competence. But usually it's a, an organization based on dominance, which is to say, you take commands from a superordinate or a superior because either they pay you to or they threaten you or both. OK, so in this case of the carrot, someone's paying you to come to work and do a job. Uh, and in the case of sticks, they're threatening you. Hey, you carry this out or else. These are two different forms of hierarchy that depend on that shore up that formality. So in essence, the formal hierarchy in this case is command and control. You're either paid or threatened to take to take commands from superiors or you're paid to be a manager of someone and to make decisions. And we've seen this a lot, whether it's the traditional firm, you know, uh, Taylor, the Taylorite firm is a very familiar form. Uh, and it's been taught in business schools for years. But there's also the army, the military. You can think of the generals giving commands to the lieutenants, giving commands to the, to, to the sergeants and the GIs and so on, down the chain of command. Interestingly, though, hierarchy is an evolved form. There are certain conditions that make it more, more or less likely in human societies for hierarchy to emerge. It does sound like they can be planned, and certainly they can, but they're involved forms, evolved forms in general. So, for example, James C. Scott in his great book, Against the Grain, talks about hierarchies, uh, states in particular, which are the ultimate hierarchies, as protection rackets. So we can imagine some, some guy coming along and saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little bit of your grain every month, but in exchange, I'm going to protect you from bigger, big bad guys like me and make sure that this is the only deal you ever have to worry about. So it's a... It's a strange form of exchange, but it's essentially how it started. In the agricultural revolution, you had settled agriculture, and you and it was you know the farmers and the yeomen uh, really were at the at the whim, I guess you could say, of these very very powerful warlords and brigands. And the bigger the brigand band, the more powerful they were. And these were sort of proto states that evolved eventually into uh, empires. So you. In battle, which is what we're talking about, so if there's this protection racket that comes around and says, I'm the biggest, baddest son of a bitch on the block, but I'm going to take a little bit of your grain, feed my army in exchange for protecting you from other big bad guys like me, we're going to need to make, I'm going to need to make a swift decision, a unitary action on behalf of the whole group. So a standing army has got to take orders in order to be effective in battle. So you get swift coordinated action. And the winning clans, of course, transform into empires. And you get the emperor, the governors, the satraps, and so on down the chain of command onto the lay people or the peons. Now, 
hierarchies scale. Hierarchies have to scale if they're going to grow. How do they scale? They scale in in two primary ways. Uh, and that and I want to give credit to Yanir Baryam, who is a professor at the New England Center for uh, Complexity Science, I think is something like that. Anyways, Yanir Baryam is his name. And I'm going to give a quick and dirty of, of what he's talking about when he really observes these complexity patterns in history. Hierarchies um, form and grow due to greater complexity. So there are two primary forces at work here. There's energy in the system and, and there is information. So energy is like work output, right? What you do in the system. And information is the kind of communication that needs to happen in order for orders to be given and carried out. So as the hierarchy grows, you get this cascading effect of more and more layers of hierarchy. And that means more middle management, more people doing highly specific tasks. The more complex the state of affairs that, that you know, whatever the hierarchy is trying to handle, which is a big battle or the construction of a temple or the administration of, city, of a city, you've got to have this calving, which is this splitting, uh, this splitting or change to the ratio of what a, any individual in the system is responsible for. If you want more specialization, you got to have fewer tasks and more people who are devoted to more specialized tasks. Scaling hierarchies means delegation. You got to give someone who's a subordinate some power to make decisions and give orders because you can't make them all. And you're also going to get briefing. You'll notice that presidents and CEOs like to be briefed, which is to say once the information travels up the chains of commands, it's got to be simple, bite-sized chunks where they can make quick decisions and that that process goes on an ongoing basis. So you get information traveling up and down the chains of command throughout the rank and file on a continuous basis. But that, of course, has its limits. And Baryam really puts his finger on these limits. A hierarchy is only as smart, if you will, uh, or can only process that amount of information that is the smartest node in the network can process, okay? Um, so each node, each person in the organization has a limit to how much information they can process. And indeed, they're on, you're only as smart as the amount of information you can process. Each node has a limit to how much work it can do. You and I, I'm doing work right now, and there's a limit to how much I can do. I can't tell you about calculus right now because I don't know calculus, and we're not talking about that. And likewise, the amount of work output for any organization has its limits, and that's because the nodes do. So when information travels up and down the chains of command, what can happen as the organization becomes too many, has too many layers? Information can get lost or corrupted, which is to say not processed correctly. Okay, so what's going to happen in a, in a hierarchy is that the organization is going to have to do something. If that information processing ability of the, these calving layers of hierarchy reaches its limit, it's going to have to trans, it's going to have to transition, which is a complexity transition, or it's going to collapse, or something in between, which is a hybrid. You can have hybrid forms, but what is the transition? The transition is that the hierarchy, if it is hybridized, is becoming a network. So this, this little picture here is a, is a good looking network design. Okay. So you either get collapse and after all collapse can, can be catastrophic. If you, uh, or anti-fragile, let's say systems that are hierarchical or decision-making is all located at the top of the system. If that decision is wrong, it, it, it can, can cascade through the whole system. That means catastrophic collapse. So you want to make sure that your decision makers at the top are really effective and really good, or you don't have so much decision-making power at the top. Okay? Hybrid systems form, of course, we said, but the transition is going to be more away from delegation eventually and more towards forming of networks. And we're living in an, an age in, when, in which information information processing systems, and decentralization technologies are going to enable this. So stay tuned. We'll talk more about that in future episodes. In the meantime, if you like what you hear and you're interested in these ideas, go pick up either or both of my books, The Social Singularity, 
or after collapse, both of them deal with this idea of decentralized systems. And particularly in after collapse, we talk about the collapse of hierarchies. My name is Max Borders. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you next time.